Today, roughly half of all Christians believe that Jesus Christ will return to earth in their lifetime. The book of Revelation contains Jesus Christ's last words to the Christian church about the future. He warns of the terrible events that will fall upon the earth during the tribulation, what will happen to Satan, to the Antichrist, and to all who follow false religion. He tells what will happen at the Battle of Armageddon, his second coming to earth, his millennial kingdom, the final judgment, and describes what God has planned for his people in eternity future. In this series, we will take you chapter by chapter through the book of Revelation to help you understand its message and the future events God predicts are up ahead. Today, we will continue to examine part three of this series, which we've entitled Armageddon, the Second Coming, and Eternity Future, Revelation chapter 14 through 22. My guests are Dr. Ed Heinsen, Dean of Liberty University's School of Religion and Distinguished Professor of Religion and the author of over 40 books. Dr. Mark Hitchcock is Associate Professor of Bible Exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary. He's the author of 30 books on biblical prophecy and is the senior pastor of Faith Bible Church. Dr. Ron Rhodes also teaches at Dallas Theological Seminary and is president of Reasoning from the Scriptures Ministries. He's the author of 70 books on prophecy. Join us for this special edition of The John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program. I'm John Ankerberg. Thanks for joining me. We're talking about the book of Revelation, and we have gotten past the Battle of Armageddon, and now Christ has come out of heaven, and we have the second coming, and we're going to be talking about what does he do? What happens next? Uh, what's been happening in heaven? These are fantastic topics, very, very interesting, and they're and especially encouraging to Christians. So, uh, Ed, start us off, pull together what we were talking about where we ended last week, and start us off this week of what we're going to cover. Okay, John, we've been through the uh, three series of seven judgments, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowl judgments. Then you come to the great climax of the book in the 19th chapter of Revelation. This is the good news for the believers. They're up in heaven. Uh, so chapter 19 opens with four alleluias of praise uh, in anticipation of the marriage of the Lamb in 19 verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor unto Him because the marriage of the Lamb has come and His wife has made herself ready. Well, throughout the New Testament, the wife, the bride of Christ, is the New Testament church, the body of genuine born-again believers. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, white and clean, for this is the righteousness of the saints, uh, the symbol of salvation in the book of Revelation, the white robe. Uh, and then he said to me, write this, blessed are those that are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So you have the church, the bride of Christ, up in heaven in the 19th chapter, presupposing the rapture had already taken place earlier. While all of these judgments of the tribulation period were going on down on earth, the bride is up in heaven with the Lord, presumably at the Bema seat judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, where she receives her rewards, including the white robe, and the white robe prepares her for the marriage the marriage is clearly in heaven. You have to get the church up to heaven in the rapture for the marriage before the return because in verse 11 it says, I saw heaven open and a white horse this time, but he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. It's not the imposter. It's the Lord Jesus himself. Uh, and he comes back with the flame of fire in his eyes like in chapter 1. He has the secret name written that no one knows but he himself. And the armies that were in heaven, verse 14, followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Well, they received that in verse 8 at the marriage. So this is obviously the church raptured to heaven to the Bema seat to the marriage and then coming back triumphantly in the return when he speaks with the sword of his mouth, slays the army of the Antichrist, and he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
This is the great climax of the book. This is the great message of hope that we're looking for. Heaven opens and Jesus returns and we return with it. Yep. Ron, the fact is, is that the rapture, as we've talked about in another series, the Bible tells us it's an imminent event. It could happen at any moment. Okay, so let's, ha let's say that it happens in the next 10 minutes, okay? And we are out of here in a second, the blink of an eye, and we find ourselves in heaven. Okay, and Ed said, we got a couple events that we know about here. First of all, the tribulation is seven years. Okay, so we got seven years for this stuff to happen, but the Bema seat is the judgment seat of Christ. This is not for unbelievers, this is only for believers. And the believers that are listening right now want to know what is Jesus going to be investigating? What are the penalties? What are the rewards? What happens here? Tell me what the judgment seat of Christ is all about. Well, that's an important question because there's a lot of people out there that tend to merge all the different judgments into one judgment. You've got the judgment of the wicked dead at the great white throne, judgment of Israel, Ezekiel 20, judgment of the nations, Matthew 25, 31 to 46. You've got six or seven judgments against Satan. I mean, there's just a lot of judgments. So what is it about Christians that will be judged? Well, let me just give a little backdrop on that very quickly. We've already talked a little bit about how there will be de degrees of punishment among the wicked because the Lord recognizes that there are different levels of wickedness among different people that are not believers. Likewise, there are different levels of commitment among believers in Jesus Christ. There are some Christians who are carnal. There are some Christians who are totally committed. Jesus is a perfect judge. And because he is a perfect judge, he's going to give rewards to those who have lived faithfully. And the kinds of rewards that scripture speaks about are couched in terms of crowns. You know, I think about the crown of righteousness and the crown of glory, crown of life. All of these are representative of the kind of rewards that Christ will give. And it's not so that we'll have our own glory. After all, in Revelation 4, it talks about how we're going to take our crowns and we're going to place them before the throne of Christ. You see, so ultimately, the rewards that we have will increase our capacity to glorify the Creator in the afterlife, which I think is a wonderful way to look at it. Now, let me be clear, John. This judgment has nothing to do with whether or not you will remain saved. That is not the question that is asked. Rather, you will stand before Christ and Christ will evaluate your life. Not just your life, but the motives in your heart, the thoughts that were in your mind. And with his all penetrating gaze, he, he knows everything. Yeah, and Mark, the Lord yeah. is also good. Everybody's going to get something. That's right. First Corinthians chapter four, the, the Bible tells us there that the motives of men's hearts will be disclosed at, the, at that point in time. And that's a powerful thing for us to think about. Again, it's not the what we do, uh, but the why behind of what we do or the motivation behind it. But after that, though, he says, and then each man's praise will come to him from God. And it's in the singular there. So I think God will find something in the life of every believer uh, to reward. I used to have the idea that some people would go away from the judgment seat, you know, empty handed. And there's poems about that and, and different things. But I, I heard a, a pastor one time point that out, that then each man's praise will come to him from God. And just to think about that, that we will stand before the Lord and, you know, the creator of the universe, the shepherd of the stars, I mean, he will find something in, in my life uh, to praise uh, me for at that period of time. If that weren't in the Bible, I wouldn't believe it. But he's going to find something in the life of each believer uh, to praise and to reward. That, that's something that should be a great encouragement, really to spur us on to live for him. Yeah, and this is also, as a result of that judgment, you get certain garments. Mm -hmm. In other words, this is where the garments come from after you're judged according to your works. Mm -hmm. So some people at the marriage supper of the Lamb, they're going to come with, they're going to be decked out, buddy. And then <laughs> the others, they're going to have something, but it won't be like some of the others. That's all right? right. But everybody's going to have something to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Well, that's right. And really, you know, when you think about uh, when, when a young woman is getting married, that's about all they think about. <laughs> You know, all the plans, the cake, and you know, where they're going to have it. I mean, all the dresses, all those various things. And it's interesting today, most believers don't think probably very often at all about the marriage of the Lamb or when they're going to be married uh, to the Lord Jesus. Right now, 
uh, the Apostle Paul says in uh, 2 Corinthians, we're betrothed to Christ. So we're kind of in that engagement period right now. And of course, when you're engaged to someone, the most important thing is for your love for them to be increasing. Uh, you're getting to know them better and becoming more intimate in your knowledge of them, but also to be faithful. And so we're in that betrothal period. But someday when we're raptured to heaven, after we've been rewarded, then we're going to be married as the bride of Jesus Christ. We're going to be brought to him and be married to him and joined uh, with him for all of eternity. And the garment that we're wearing on that day will be the garment of our own making. And so I think it's incumbent upon each of us to think about that and ask ourselves, uh, what, where will I be? What will I be uh, doing? What will it be like uh, when I stand before the Lord at that time? Yeah, it's just like the, when, when Jesus says he stands in the middle of the seven churches here and he's looking at each one, he knows their hearts, and he knows their deeds, and he, you know, it's wide open to him, okay? If he is looking at us as we go to church, you have to say, how do we worship? Do we really worship the Lord or are we there just to show up and go through the process of we showed up on Sunday? Are we really there to please the Lord? Are we really there to hear about what the Bible says? So we're going to carry that out in our life the rest of the week. Those are the kinds of things we're talking about here. How do we serve the Lord? He knows our hearts. He knows what we think about him. And what else would you say, Ron? I would just say that I don't think this should be one of those doctrines that instills a great deal of fear, but rather instills reverence for our Lord and wanting to please the Lord for not only what he has accomplished in, in our salvation, but for what the future holds in that reward. Yeah. I always think that uh, the scripture says when Paul says you're going to be judged for both the good things you've done and the bad things. I always think of that in terms of when you get saved, the Lord looks down, he sees you got the, his whole life, your whole life planned out in front of you. And if you follow him in everything, here's the whole deck of rewards that are for you. But if you don't follow him in some of these spots, you lose this one, you lose this one, you lose this one, you lose that one. And so I think when we get to the Bema seat, Mark, the fact is there's gonna be a loss of reward that we could have had if we'd served the Lord as he wants us to. Well, that's right. And, and, you know, there's there's different rewards God's going to give us. I mentioned earlier, each man's praise will come to him from God. So one of the things we'll receive there is God's praise. We're also going to have uh, these crowns that we'll receive, kind of privileges, we might say, that uh, are given to us that we cast at his feet. But there's also position um, in the coming millennial kingdom. So, you know, some will rule over five cities. Some will rule over ten cities. So there's going to be positions of authority that are given to us based on our faithfulness now here in this life. So the person we are today really is determining the person that we'll be in the, the position and the place we will have in all of eternity for heaven. So that really gives a, a gravity and a seriousness to our lives now, but a great joy to serve our Lord faithfully now so that we can serve him faithfully for all of eternity. Yeah, and just to think that he would give us any reward right. is really yeah. incredible. It's all grace. Uh, guys, we have now come to this point where Jesus has won and the world is his. And tell me what he does next. Well, as the chapter at this point opens in chapter 20, uh, it says uh, that he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, the devil, Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So at the return of Christ, we saw last time that Jesus comes back, wins the battle of Armageddon, the beast and the false prophet are cast alive into the lake of fire, they remain there for the next thousand years. In the meantime, Satan is bound for a thousand years. He cast him into the abyss or the bottomless pit, shut him in, sealed him up so he could not deceive the nations until the thousand years were ended. And then he talks about those that are reigning and ruling with Christ on earth for those thousand years. So we would have to assume the earth is reconstituted under the presence of Christ there's a glorious millennial reign of peace and prosperity. There's no more war. Satan can't get out to deceive the nations. And you have this ideal age of millennial blessing. And yet some try to say, oh, Satan was bound by the power of the cross. He's already bound. Revelation 20 is already fulfilled. Well, no, Satan is alive and well on planet Earth. Peter said he wanders about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Paul said he's the prince of the power of the air who now works in the hearts of the children of disobedience. Satan's not bound yet, 
like he is going to be here in Revelation chapter 20. That's when God will shut him up in the abyss and he cannot get out, cannot deceive the nations, and he's going to give the world an opportunity to finally realize the potential that they could have had all along. Uh, a potential that's not heaven, but it's almost heaven on earth. Before we talk more about the millennial time period and what people experience, I want to pick up on this thing that the devil is thrown into this pit. And it says in Revelation 20.10, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, we get to the great white throne judgment. We finally get to the spot where finally he's put into that pit, never to get out again. But the fact is, there's a verse that goes with this. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Now, Mark, at this point, when the devil and his angels are thrown into the pit forever and ever, and their smoke ascends forever, you have everlasting punishment without end. It associates the people that took the mark of the beast or the people that even during our time have rejected Jesus Christ. Yet, we find in some of our Christian circles today that there are two kinds of annihilationism that is being embraced, okay? Because they don't like the doctrine of eternal punishing, okay? Mm -hmm. And so they try to change it. And there are two definitions of annihilationism. Give them to us. Yes, these two views are, are there's called annihilationism. That's the view that uh, all, everyone's immortal but unbelievers. And so unbelievers, when they die, if they're without the Lord, they're just immediately annihilated. They cease to exist. We know that can't be true because the Bible tells us there are degrees of punishment in the afterlife. And you can't have degrees of annihilation. Either you're annihilated or you're not. Others hold a view called conditional immortality. This would say that, that everyone is mortal, but believers gain immortality than at death. And that sometime after they're cast into the lake of fire, unbelievers live on for some period of time, but then at some point they are, are annihilated then or cease to exist. Their, their immortality is conditional. Uh, but those passages you've read talk about this being forever and ever. They talk about uh, this being uh, eternal and seem to go against this idea that somehow uh, this punishment will, will end. Also, it's fascinating. It says that the beast and the false prophet at Jesus' second coming are cast into uh, the lake of fire. Then a thousand years later, when Satan and his angels are cast there, it says the beast and the false prophet are there also. So they've been here, been there that entire thousand year period of time. They weren't annihilated in some way. They're still there. Yeah. Also, let's point out that annihilationism ultimately escapes punishment. Mm -hmm. A punishment that is not conscious is not a punishment at all. Mm -hmm. You see, and yet this is portrayed as an eternal punishment. And it's interesting that the same word for eternal is used for the punishment of the wicked and for the salvation of the righteous. Yeah, as long as the righteous have everlasting life, same thing is said about right. those who are the wicked, they're going to be experiencing eternal punishing. Yes. Let's turn this around to the good news of the millennium. First of all, you've got the people that uh, are in human bodies on the earth that are believers that made it finally through the end of the tribulation, okay? The Jews that believed in Jesus that he rescued, they're part of it. There are probably other Christians around the world that somehow made it through. So they come into this kingdom, the millennial kingdom, and the bride of Christ comes riding with Christ when he comes back to earth. So the bride of Christ who have changed bodies immortal bodies, imperishable bodies, not human bodies, they also are a part of this crowd. Now, how does this all work out? Well, I think it comes out, John, in that fourth verse of the chapter that says, I saw thrones and they that sat on them, judgment was committed to them. 
Jesus said to his disciples that they would judge people uh, in this time of the millennial kingdom, uh, and they lived and reigned with Christ uh, for a thousand years, etc. So you have two things going on. You have believers who went up in the rapture in a glorified body. They're coming back to reign and rule with Christ. You also have people who were saved out of the great tribulation, uh, according to chapter 7, who are in natural bodies and are serving the Lord throughout this period of time. And they presumably are the people who are also having children and families for the generations of that thousand years because the big shock, the big surprise in the book of Revelation is at the end of the thousand years, Satan is loosed and goes about to deceive those nations, not the raptured people, but those people that have survived on into the millennial kingdom. Some of them will rebel at the time of the end of the millennium. What's God's purpose for that? I think it's to test the hearts of human beings, to show the depravity of the human heart, to also show the grace of God, that God has done everything He can to give them a perfect environment in which to live, but the environment alone doesn't save you. Uh, it doesn't change you. Even seeing the miracles of God won't in itself change you. A lot of people saw Jesus' miracles and still did not believe in Him. The Spirit of God has to change you. He has to redeem you. He has to convert you and save you. He has to transform your inner being by His power. And I think that's what the message of the millennium is all about. God will fulfill His promises to Israel, a literal kingdom on earth, but that literal kingdom is still a human kingdom that is going to come to an end when Jesus finally delivers the kingdom to the Father for all eternity and you're merged then into the eternal kingdom in the closing chapters of the book of Revelation. Ed, a lot of people have never heard this and they've really never taken Jesus seriously, okay? If God has spoken to them through this program, they don't want to be in hell forever, they would love to be in that millennial kingdom. They would love to go into eternity future or new heavens, new earth. We're going to talk about that next week. How can they come into a relationship personally with Jesus Christ if they have not done that, don't know how to do it, advise them how to do it? By receiving the king. <laughs> That's how you do it. Uh, you don't have to join a particular church or group or give or do anything. You respond to the grace of God by faith to say, I really do believe Jesus is who He said He was, that He can do what He said He can do, that He died for my sins in my place, that He rose from the dead for me and is willing to give me the gift of eternal life. And I receive that by faith. I pledge my heart and life and soul to Him forever and I trust Him and trust what He did on the cross, that that's enough that when Jesus said from the cross, it is finished, paid in full, He paid it in full for me. I personalize that faith by believing in that, by trusting in Him, and by receiving the gift of eternal life. Right. Folks, Jesus did everything that is necessary when He was on that cross to present you before the Father, clean and pure. He paid for all of your sins. And he offers it to you as a gift. The gift of God is eternal life, and it comes through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And if you will come to him, all of these promises that we've been talking about in the Bible, they become your promises that God has made to you. He will not change his mind, and you will experience him while you live. Now, next week, we're going to talk about what happens after the millennial kingdom. Many of you have never even heard this. What happens in eternity future? What is this new thing about the new Jerusalem? And what is it when we have the recreation of earth, a new heaven, a new earth? What does all that mean? It's fantastic stuff. I hope that you'll join us. If you would like to have all of the information in our new series, The Last Words of Jesus, the Book of Revelation. Our nine television programs are available on three DVDs. Our first DVD covers Revelation 1 through 6 and is titled, The Glorified Jesus Reveals the Future. Our guests describe Jesus' appearance to John and his commission to him to write the Book of Revelation. 
John then writes letters to the seven churches and is taken up to the throne room of God where he sees Jesus open seven seals that rain down different judgments on earth. Our second DVD contains three more programs that cover chapters 7 through 13, which we have titled, The Judgments and Main Players of the Tribulation. Here, we learn about the seven trumpet judgments. As a result of the seal and trumpet judgments, half of the world's population will die. We'll then discover the main players in the tribulation, including a woman, a child, and a dragon who symbolize Israel, Jesus, and Satan. We are told about the Antichrist, the false prophet, the mark of the beast, and 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Our third DVD is entitled Armageddon, the Second Coming and Eternity Future and covers Revelation chapters 14 through 22. Here we learn about the seven horrible bowl judgments and the battle of Armageddon. Jesus will defeat his enemies at his second coming and set up his millennial kingdom on earth. This will be followed by God's final judgment and a description of the new heaven and earth for believers. Today, you may order our entire series on Revelation containing all nine television programs for $110. With this series, we are going to include our 168-page book of Revelation study guide. This new study guide includes extensive notes that parallel our television programs with nine sessions for your personal study or Bible study group. If you'd like to have five or more study guides, they are available for $8 each. Finally, I taped a one-hour question and answer session with our scholars discussing the rapture, the identity of the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, the coming global government, and much, much more. You may obtain this DVD for a gift of $20. And if you'd like to have all of these materials together, including all nine DVD programs, our new 168-page study guide, plus the one-hour question and answer session, they are available together in a special package for only $125. You may order the special package now by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. Or you may also order these materials at jashow.org.